Um, it, so it's a great pleasure, as I said, to introduce uh, our speaker today, Claudio Colosi from the University of Geneva. Um, Claudio is um, a prolific um, contributor to metaphysics and in particular the metaphysics of physics, uh, the rich intersection between physics and metaphysics. And um, in addition to um, the metaphysics of quantum mechanics, um, he's the principal investigator of the um, project metaphysics of quantum objects. Um, he's also very well known um, and also normally right um, as a contributor to the metaphysics of space time and persistence. But today uh, the topic is wave function monism. So Claudio, over to you. Thank you so much. So thanks, uh, thanks for being here. This, this is just great. And, you know, whole friends, new friends, hopefully. And it's, it's good to actually put a face onto the names. <laughs> Sometimes it's just I'm Chris. Anyway. Um, so let me, let me begin um, by saying that this is going to be a little bit more, more metaphysics than you're probably used to here. So I'm just going to try to actually make you uh, agree with me that this is important to do um, so th this sort of metaphysics. And then uh, to shine is not here, but last, last, last week, he said that the metaphysician is almost like a bartender. <laughs> and I think I would make a good bartender. So I thought like, that was exactly so. Um, so let me, let me jump away. So let me jump right in. Um, so this is the structure of the talk. It, it might seem complicated, but it, I think it's really straightforward. So I'm not going to spend any, uh, any time on this. But these abbreviations is just my technical stupidity. I cannot fit in the LaTeX the entire titles. That's why. Uh, I, so, um, so, so today I'm, I'm going to be interested in what, what I call wave function monism, but really what I'm interested in is the following wave function meteorological priority monism. Is, um, so roughly is the, is the following view. There is only one fundamental entity, uh, the universal quantum wave function, or better, whatever the universal quantum wave function stands for. And non-fundamental derivative entities are literally speaking, meteorological parts of it. Okay. So recently this view has attracted considerable attention in both philosophy of physics and metaphysics. Uh, Healy has something on it, uh, Stephen French discussed it, Peter Lewis. And most notably, it has been defended at length by Alice Sané. And it's basically the, one of the main metaphysical theses of a new book. And I think you guys last week had, last, last semester, right? You had Alisa here, which she gave you like three arguments for, because it was online, three arguments for monism. We, we're gonna see one of them. Um, and to a different extent, uh, probably also Schaffer and Jenna Nisman, which by the way, it happens to be her birthday today. <laughs> so that's good. <laughs> And as I was saying, um, uh, this is going to be a little bit more, uh, more metaphysics. -y, and I think that there are different varieties in the metaphysics literature of monism. So I think it, it's, it's good to have actually a clear chart um, about that. And his um, monism has an incredibly philosophical, incredible philosophical pedigree in the history of philosophy. So these are just quotes that I randomly took. Um, so I'm not going to read, I'm just going to leave it on the screen. Um, so all I want you to know is that, so they, they all actually supposedly actually uh, state some monistic thesis, but they're saying very different things. So take the first one and says, there's just one thing, right? So Oliver, so if I exist, Oliver doesn't exist on that view, because it exists only one thing. If, if, it, if that's me, it cannot be Oliver. I'm paying up, you know, invalidating B1 on logic. Uh, but Plutinian says, well, the one is the only thing on which everything else depends. Spinoza says that there's no, there's no, there's only one substance. And then you see, you see Rice, they're actually saying everything is part, is literally part. So we get close to what we're going to see, literally part of one real being. So different, uh, but it's not just philosophy per se. So here are philosophers of physics. I, don't, I, I, don't, I didn't do that. So philosophers of physics saying that. So this is an old friend of all of us, I guess, Alastair Wilson, in a well, like 10 years paper on American quantum mechanics, which is actually explicitly say that at the fundamental level, the ontology is monistic. There is just one single structure object, which is exactly the quantum state. And this is uh, another friend from the North, or at least, I mean, he's in the North, 
uh, Leeds is in the north, right? It's really north. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so this um, Stephen French, that he is criticizing wave function realism, the, one, the view that, but he says, look, um, you can actually um, turn to the monist wardrobe for a possible metaphysical suit of clothes to which dress the view. That's exactly what we're going to do here. Uh, and, and we'll go a little bit in detail. As a matter of fact, I found out an old paper, which is uh, interesting, an old paper by Grossman that says exactly thinking about this, thinking about monism on the one hand and a pluralism, which is the opposite view, and in particular a variety of pluralism, which is called atomism, which we're not gonna enter here because otherwise I'll just talk, start talking about neurology. Um, so he says, well, we must take our cue from physics and, being, uh, and, and starting the difficult tasks of examining non-atomistic philosoph philosophy of the past. And then he quotes really the monistic thinker of the past and also not non-Western traditions. And then he has this fantastic line that says, one thing I'm certain, if we don't do this job, physicists will, which I, I don't know whether th this sounds bad, I guess, oh, we should do it, not a physicist. <laughs> but in any case, some physicists did do it, as a matter of fact. So here is uh, the last book, I think, by David Bone and Healy. And it has been argued, Oh, by the way, a disclaimer, the fact that I put the quotes uh, and, and the book doesn't mean that I read them. So, <laughs> so please don't, don't ask about chapter seven. So I know that Dean Zimmerman has actually argued in print, in print that the, the notion of implicate order, which you find at the end of the book is reminiscent of the classic monistic argument from that's it is usually called the metaphysics, the interconnectedness of everything with everything argument. Everything is, is interconnected with everything else. And this is the signature of one holistic. Uh, cosmos being more fundamental. And here, uh, this is Scientific American. Uh, I, I put the link. It says that it, it goes f f farther and say the quantum units couldn't even save the soul of physics. I didn't read the article, <laughs> by the way. But, 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 but you see what I'm going, right? So this, this, this seems that, um, important. Um, and and so, to give you a matter of, you know, also a, a measure of the importance. So the other view, pluralism, the view that there are, let's say, more, uh, more than one fundamental object in its most traditional variety is atomism. And if you actually open the first page of Feynman Lectures in Physics, it just says that uh, the, the most important scientific achievement ever is, is just uh, encompassed in the sentence, everything is made up of atoms. So it seems that also for physics, this uh, is important, but I want to actually um, convince you that it's, it, it really goes beyond that. So here, they usually do these things. So here are two of the most beautiful poems I found, um, which has some monistic feelings. So this is starts by Emily Bronte, um, which is just, so she, she was writing that just a few kilometers not from Leeds, and she was she was writing this this poem stars when when she was writing um, also Withering Nights, and she has this beautiful beautiful line that goes. You know, and that everything. So, if you read the, the, the poem, the message is that if you look closely to nature, you will prove you that we are all one. Okay. And the other one is, um, I think it's from the second edition of Armonium, the first, um, uh, the first poem, uh, poetry collection of the great American poet Wallace Stevens, which has this fantastic verse like, out of all the influence, indifferences into one thing, we feel the obscurity of an order at home. So I usually use this as a title, but I use it so many times, I just, I just left it there. And um, so actually, I think that the most interesting literary um, source for this debate is actually John Donne, because I think John Donne is both a radical, like um, a radical pluralistic view, which almost uh, parallels you know, fragmentalism, Martin Lippmann is on Zoom. And sometimes even in the famous meditation 23, for example, the one don't ask for whom the bell tolls, the bell tolls for me. There's a line in which it says, we're all one and every death diminishes me. Uh, so it's a really interesting case study, but I didn't want to go to exegesis on John Donne, but I do want to actually bring you from another literary masterpiece and close to where um, Maria and I live. Uh, so this is Switzerland and this is, um, the actual sanatorium where Thomas Mann Magic Mountain is taking place. So you can still go there, you can still see room 34 by Hans Kastop, you can still take the walk, you can still do all of these things. Why, why am I putting it there beside you know, Switzerland where we live? 
It's just so in, in, there's, there's a famous chapter in which they discuss exactly two characters, two philosophers discuss exactly monism and pluralism. And we will go back to it exactly because 10 kilometers from there on another sanatorium for tuberculosis in Arosa, Schrodinger, two years later, was writing the paper, uh, the quantum mechanics as, as, a, as an eigenvalue problem, or whatever it's called in English, in which he introduces the quantum state. This is just, so this is on this hill, and, and Schrodinger was on this other hill with his mistress. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, so probably the, you know, the fate of monism and pluralism was decided um, in, in these hills in, in Switzerland. Uh, this is an amazing place. Uh, it's just beautiful, it's absolutely beautiful. I think we should go to summer school there as a matter of fact. So, okay, so this, this is just the introduction. This is the most interesting part. And then, now, now we're gonna do philosophy. <laughs> okay, good. So this is just to say that this is important. Like it, the importance of this debate goes beyond, um, you know, physics, philosophy, and so on. It just really, it, it's, uh, it's something that's really uh, all encompassing. So let, let us try to do a little bit of charting um, of metaphysical positions. So the weakest monistic thesis I can think of, and I will take it to be the weakest monistic thing, is the following, the one you have in one. There is one fundamental entity. And as of now, I will take fundamental as just a piece of primitive ideology. So I think that if you deny one, you're not a monist anymore, you're a pluralist. If you say there are two things that are fundamental, whatever they are, take Oliver in this chair, you're gonna be a pluralist. So it's very not, not that, you know, monism is very demanding. So, but as you notice, right, one doesn't say whether there are any things that are not fundamental. It's just silent on this. Suppose you add the claim that there is one fundamental entity and there are no derivative ones, that is no fundamental ones. What you get is what's called in the literature sometimes existence. Because what you get is basically, I mean, model the assumptions that things are either fundamental or non-fundamental, right? A classical assumption. What you get is that there is one thing. But suppose you add the, you know, for a first side, more plausible view that there are derivative entities, what you get is another form of monism, which is it's called the priority monism. There is one fundamental entity and there are derivative ones. In this view, uh, so for example, um, I don't know, Chris might be the fundamental thing, but Oliver and I might still exist, we're just not fundamental, okay? Um, so this chart is a little bit different from what you found in the literature. Um, I use it for different reasons, you will see why. Now, three is silent over what relation holds between the fundamental entity, say Chris, and the derivative one, say Oliver and me, beside the fact that, of course, a relation of less fundamental than holds. But it doesn't tell us anything about what relation, what substantive relation tracks that. Now, if you plug in that the, the, the fundamental entity and the derivative ones are related by a specific relation, then you get different varieties of priority monism. And here are three that I think are important, either in the history of philosophy, or in the contemporary debate. The first one is the one that we're going to see. There is one fundamental entity, there are derivative ones, and the derivative ones are proper parts, literally, of the fundamental entity. The second one probably recognized is associated with the name of Spinoza in the history of philosophy. There is one fundamental entity, there are derivative ones, and the derivative ones are modes, okay? And the other ones I put because, um, there is the pattern priority monism says there's one fundamental entity, there are derivative ones, and the derivative ones are patterns in the fundamental structure, which I think some people in Oxford might, might be you know, sympathetic with. That's why I put it here. I don't know anything actually about the formal profile of the relation pattern um, structure, so I'm not going to say anything. I know a little bit more about these two, and I'm going to focus on this because mirrorology is the only thing I know. So I formulated this chart in such a way. So it's a very simple formulation in such a way that it can, the logical relations between this view can be just summed up to these graphics, okay? So, uh, wait. so every logical, every logical entailment from right to left along the lines goes through. So you can always move just by logic alone from here to here to here along the lines, but you can never move from left to right. So from, to move from left to right, you need some metaphysics. Okay, that's it. And of course you have to go through lines, okay? So you cannot move directly from here. But, so this is just the monism chart. This is just to say monism comes, uh, come, I mean, comes in, in many varieties, right? And it's a, it's a substantive question, which variety quantum mechanics supports, if any? Like I think 
This is a preliminary metaphysical work that you should do. Now, the other component, if you remember the introduction, is that wave function realism. So some sort of realism about the wave function. Now, even this, right, comes in many, in many varieties. So these are your familiar, so I'm just really going um, very quick because this is things, something you're completely familiar with. So suppose we, we were just uh, dealing for sake of simplicity, uh, but there's a question here, of course, and, and Chris and David Wallace actually pointed, um, pointed out a, a problem for wave function realism as we will discuss, but suppose we actually stick to a n particle, n particle world. So the wave function, the universal wave function uh, represents, so he, here's a possibility, it represents a multi-field that specifies a field value for n pool of points of three-dimensional space. It's mentioned in a, in a, in a, in a paper by Gordon Bellet. It's, it's defended at length in Hubert and Romano, and I think Davide Romano has a new paper on this. Um, he, here's another option. It represents a property-like entity, say a disposition. I'm, I'm gonna say, I, I say, say a disposition because Suarez so actually defended the view that it is in fact a disposition of the meteorological sum of the n particles, or if you want to use plural logic and you don't want to use meteorology, you don't want to use sums, because for example, you are convinced by the arguments by Adam that you know, meteorological sums are tricky in quantum mechanics. It's a disposition of the, of the plurality, okay? So highly, we were already seeing the one by Al, uh, a friend of ours, like a highly structured object life entity. And there's people that philosophy of physics like Tim Modlin that goes as far as saying, it represents an entirely new kind of entity. We should just stop trying to actually put it in the ontological categories that we had from Aristotle categories. Um, so on and so forth, but, so I'm, I'm not gonna say anything about this. The view that uh, we're gonna tackle here is the view that the, wave fun the universal wave function represents a field in three n-dimensional configuration space. The view was famously put forward first by David Albert, then advocated by Peter Lewis, Jill North, and recently I think, it was defended in a book length defense of the view there by Alisa. Okay. So, the, the, um, so the view that, that we're interested in is basically a combination of this kind of realism about the wave function and the monistic picture, which is priority meteorological monism. The view that there is one fundamental whole and the derivative entities are parts of it. That's the combination we're interested in. Okay. So, and here, so I put quotes here just to make you see that I'm not cheating. I'm not just constructing someone out of thin air that no one defends. So, but I'm not gonna read the entire thing. Uh, so, but you can see it. So this is Alisa in a paper that immediately before the book. Um, so that says that according to the wave function realist, only the wave function is fundamental. And the, the metaphysical relation obtaining between the, the particles here and the way is a meteorological relation, like strictly speaking, meteorological relation. And she explicitly relates it to Schaffer's priority monism, which is what I call meteorological priority monism. Um, so this is, this is her again in the book. Uh, the wave function is the fundamental whole and the particle that's the derivative parts, okay? The picture recalls Schaffer's priority monism. And so Alisa actually is explicit and, and, and she, she was super sweet. She gave me wonderful comments on, on, on drafts of, of this paper already. And Ismail and Shaffer, I think the case is a little bit more subtle because they claim explicitly that, so this is a paper that appeared in, in, in a collection on uh, the metaphysics of entanglement, I think edited by George Darby, which I think was here at a certain point. Um, so they claim explicitly the way function realism provide a, what they call a common ground explanation. They really want to use the grounding, but I mean, it doesn't matter for us. Like, and they relate common ground explanation to actually the classic monistic thesis of the whole being prior to its parts. So there is a link here, but I think that position might be a little bit more subtle. Than, and we will come back to this, uh, also analyzing something that uh, Chris um, Gibson there uh, wrote, that it was. Now, before I start actually, so this is the picture. And we're gonna assess that. We're gonna assess, we're gonna give the first clear assessment of, of, of this view, this, uh, this combination of views. Um, but before I start actually uh, doing that, let me say that you might, be, you might be already skeptical about the whole enterprise, because as you can see, I didn't say anything about the interpretations. Like I didn't say that interpretations matter here, right? Uh, and you might disagree. And, and as a matter of fact, 
I think on some level, I, I do myself disagree. I think some details about interpretations matter. And there are different ways of making the point, but I know that Carlo is in Zoom. I think the best way, the, the most straightforward argument uh, is, is looking at the relation of quantum mechanics. I think uh, the, the, the monistic picture uh, that, that, you know, are, are under scrutiny is under scrutiny. I think it's just incompatible with this interpretation. Because I think kind of, Independently of, of, of his take of unrealism or wave function, I think kind of should uh, would, want, would want to actually deny that there is a universal wave function. So, it, it, but so why am I doing that? Why then am I leaving aside all the interpretations? Because that's what they do. And, you know, it, it's like, I don't know, it, it's like, so, so, so you go to a soccer game, there, there are two ways, right? Either, either you don't play, so if you don't play, you don't lose, right? <laughs> But there's another way, like just play and let's see if you can win. So that's what I'm doing here. Like, let's play with them. Um, and, and so for the rest of the paper, basically I would just uh, put aside uh, questions of interpretation. Now, here's what I wanna do for, um, first. I'm gonna put forward what I think is an admittedly unfair argument against them. But why am I doing that? Because I think it highlights a genuine tension within the picture, a tension that if we go into subtleties, will reappear over again, no matter what we do. So, and let me, and so let me go over uh, the, the, the unfair argument. So the unfair argument is that if you have the combination of views, it threatens to undermine the, the, the most important, this master argument for the components. Why? What are the master arguments for the components? First of all, I'm gonna argue I'm going to show you what is taken usually to be the master argument for metallurgical priority monism in the quantum domain and then wave function theories. So the first one is called usually the determination argument. This is Matteo Morganti uh, summarizing it in an early paper. Uh, but so the, the, the argument is due to Jonathan Schaffer. So I, I think this, so it's, a, it's, it's a paper called The Priority of the Whole. And I think it was the most downloaded paper in, in Phil Revier for the past something 20 years. Uh, so, and, and this is just to say once again, the minor, I'm, a little, I'm gonna be fair in my reconstruction, so I, I leave it here. But, so I'm, I'm not gonna read, of course, the, the quotation. So here's the argument though. So I think it crucially depends on what we call whole part determination, which is the following kind. For any quantum whole W, with parts P1 to Pn, which I always take, you know, there's a finite number of parts, it's easier. The state of the whole always determine that of the parts, whereas the converse does not hold. In particular, it does not hold for entangled states. Okay. Well, I, I, I'm willingly uh, vague about the determination relation. I don't wanna, I don't know whether you should be cashed out in terms of grounding, dependence, supervenience, and so on and so forth. A relation of determination of fixing will do for our purposes. Because I'm not, so it's not the aim of the paper either to defend or criticize the, argu the, the argument for the components. It's just to assess the combination. So Schaffer thinks that the best metaphysical, the, the best metaphysical lesson to draw from five is six. You might disagree here, but given that I'm, I have no interest in criticizing the argument, I'm just going to grant everything. So entangled systems are fundamental holes, their parts being derivative. He thinks that this is the metaphysics lesson to draw from this, which is kind of a, almost mathematics. Right? Then he argues that the cosmos, which is melodical fusions of all concrete objects, we we'll return to this, is an entangled system, doesn't matter how he argues, he argues for a you know, uh, linearity of the Schrodinger equation and so on and so forth. So what, the, what you derive is that clearly from, from six and seven, you derive that the cosmos is fundamental. You haven't derived priority monism yet, right? Because you're just saying that there is one thing which is fundamental. You didn't say that there's only one thing, okay? So how do you derive that? You derive that because Schaffer thinks that the, so if I ask you the following questions, what are the fundamental entities? What are the concrete fundamental entities of the universe? Every answer to this question should be constrained by what he called the timing constraint. The timing constraint is the, because the conjunction of the following. The fusion of the, one, of the fundamental things is the universe and no two distinct fundamental things overlap. Now, a lot of things follow from this, but what we're interested in, it follows straightforwardly from conjunct two that if the universe is, if the cosmos is fundamental, nothing else is. 
Why? Because everything else overlaps it. Okay. So it really, you can really derive priority monism. Like this is a, this might be, that might sound like innocent, but I think it's very strong. Like, and I have done formal work to actually derive the consequences, but they're just gonna, I'm just gonna upgrade it. So this is the master argument from why, okay, you get that the cosmos is fundamental. It's basically uh, this determination argument. So this is the first component, right? This is the component of monism, right? In quantum mechanics. Now, the other component is wave function realism. When cashed out, there's the view that the wave function is a field in higher uh, dimensional configuration space. So here, so Alisa goes on, and I think she gave exactly that talk here, right? It was really taught called like three arguments for wave function realism. So it went from, you know, and that's the last one, which she thinks is the master argument. And the argument goes something like this. Separability and locality are desirable features of metaphysics or fundamental metaphysics. Wave function realism is the only metaphysics of quantum mechanics. It is both separable and local. Even eight and nine, all else being equal, which of course it's never the case. We should indeed prefer wave function realism with its rivals. Now, once again, it's not my intention to. Um, uh, to either criticize or defend the argument. As a matter of fact, I don't even remember the argument that Alisa has for eight. So I, I'm not attached to separability. I don't know why, but so I, I don't even remember that. But, so but we're just going to take the argument as it stands. OK, good. So but the crucial notion here is really separability. OK, and there are different formulations. So I, I'm going to give one which um, parallels the one Alisa gives in, in, in a number of places in the paper, quoting also uh, Don Auer, the classic, or, or Einstein, and um, so uh, Chris as a formulation, Healy as another formulation. You can have it in terms of space-time regions, but more in general, I think. So this is a first pass. Metaphysics is separable, if not if. It admits of composite holes, and for any admissible composite holes with parts, one PM, state of the parts, the third minus state of the hole. I just found out that there's a, there's a um, scheme in three that seems a very beautiful paper by Ramirez in the studies of history of modern physics, which relates it back to the very first formulation in Einstein. Okay, so, so now we, we know what the two arguments for the components are, right? And now I'm gonna argue, right, that there's a tension, there's a tension there, which you should immediately see because whole part determination is clearly something that points to non separability right? So it's admittedly unfair, but I think it highlights attention that we'll receive this. So here's the official formulation of the deep. Wave function with logical priority monism. So when I say wave function monism, I'm, 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 I really mean this. Chris, did, did you have a question? No. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, so the wave, as I will call it, because it's more dramatic than the wave function. The wave is the only fundamental entity and the derivative ones comprising all of us are literally metallurgical parts of the wave. So here's the admittedly unfair first, uh, first pass out. Wave function metallurgical priority monism threatens to undermine the master arguments in favor of its components. And we already see that, right? That's how, that's how stupid the argument is. I mean, stupid meaning like, I think it, it needs to be refined. Well, the argument is that there is no separable ontology. If you stick to this graph formulation of separability and the whole determination principle, there is no separable ontology that obeys part of all part determination. Conversely, there is no ontology that obeys all part determination in its full generality as a phrase did, which is also separable. So, and of course, I, I mean, unsurprisingly, you should see that just by focusing on a three-dimensional entangled systems. Let's say it's just to have proper parts P1 and P2, these are part of the fundamental entity, so it's in the remit of separability as I formulated it, right? So the state W is that separability demands that the state W, right, is, is fixed by the state of the parts, but of course that's exactly contrary to whole part determination. Good. So, so faced with this just, once again, admittedly unfair argument, what can you do? Well, you can just, you know, let go of the determination of separability argument and find other arguments. But I think what the argument does, at first, I think, it points to a general and general intention. 
Um, I'm, I'm not sure that I was able to actually find a way to completely make uh, make the tension disappear. But, but you know, but the, the fact that I didn't find any way doesn't mean that there is no way. Usually, the fact from the fact that I cannot do anything doesn't follow anything from about the world. So, but what's the tension? Monism is a metaphysics that usually and classically points to top-down determination. Okay. By contrast, separability seems a paradigmatic example of bottom-up. That's the tension. So if you, if you take them separately, it's completely fine. But now if you, what we function with logical priority monism does, it really putting them together. And then I think it's not a marriage made in heaven. Uh, so, but as I said, like this is unfair because I was just, I mean, I was admittedly and consciously like unfair in the formulations of the grid. So let's see whether we can refine the view to, to make the tension disappear. And what I'm going to argue is that it's more difficult than it might seem at first sight. So, so here's Elisa, sometimes she says, the way function metaphysics is fundamentally separable. She doesn't say separable, she says fundamentally separable, which seems to, she has in mind the distinction between being separable to core and being separable at the fundamental level, whatever that might mean. So let's see if, if we can define different notions of separability that will help her. I mean, not her, like you said, her, it's a friend. It's just help the way function the logical priority one is guy. So here are two attempts. And I don't think that neither works, as a matter of fact. So here's one. A metaphysics is fundamentally separable if it meets a fundamental holes and for an admissible fundamental hole with parts, state of the parts determine the state of the whole. Here's another, a metaphysics is fundamentally separable if it admits of composite holes with fundamental parts such that the fundamental parts now determine the state of the whole. Okay, you should be able, you should be able to see that fundamentally two, funda fundamental separability two doesn't have any shot. Because, I mean, modulo, you having a very weird meteorology, like, pro there is, if you have in your background meteorology, then nothing can have a single proper part, right? Which a lot of meteorological axioms usually entail, as a matter of fact. You can see that fundamental, fundamental separability is simply inconsistent with monism. It will say that at least two proper parts are going to be fundamental. Okay. What about fundamental separability one? Well, it might not be in contrast directly with monism, right? Because the composite whole might not have the parts at the fundamental level, it might have parts here, but it still seems that it's in tension uh, with the determination argument. Because the determination argument has it that it shouldn't be the case that the part determine the whole. So I think you need a little bit more than just play with restricted quantifiers if you do it formally. So, and how, so, and this is my attempt to, to, to actually <laughs> get him the, the best shot. <clears throat> now, once again, I'm gonna be, I don't wanna claim that this is the best attempt. I'm just gonna claim that this is the thing I could come up with, which usually once again, doesn't take anything. But, but I will, I, I, I will actually um, motivate the attempt for you. It's not just, oh, this is the only thing I could do. Um, and this takes a page uh, out of, um, as, 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 as uh, Ricky Bliss and, and Priest point out, a picture that they say looms large over contemporary analytic metaphysics. Picture according to which realities are hierarchically arranged um, in levels, and there are entities in those levels, and these are related by some determination relation, they call either ontological dependence or grounding, but for us it's just a determination relation, and terminates in something fundamental. Okay, bottoms out at something which is absolutely for that. The, the same attitude is, is voiced here by Ted Seidler in, in his new book on uh, metaphysics of science. There's a familiar levels picture of reality in which facts at the higher level, so you have layer here, layer here, and facts here, I mean, uh, depend somehow, right? Rest, as he says, on facts on the lower level. And there is an absolute, uh, it's an absolute level of, of absolutely fundamental evidence. Okay, why I chose this because I think Alisa, in particular, in the book, speaks as this is 
I mean, she goes very, very close to these kind of pictures. So I thought maybe that's the right picture. So what I'm going to do now is um, she, she doesn't go into the details. And so what I'm going to do now is that first, I'm just going to give you a sketch of how this picture applies in this context. And then I'm going to try to make it more precise, not as, as, not, not as precise as I would be, because I would really like to do it formally. So I have some formal works later, but I couldn't. But at least a little bit more than this vague sketch. So the vague sketch was something like this. There is a fundamental level, the configuration space level. The only object at that level is the wave. Crucially, and I'm going to say aloud, I'm going to go and recognize this, Alisa doesn't buy into the, I mean, she doesn't say anything about this, the following part, which is crucial in my account. There are no proper parts of the wave at the configuration space level. This is crucial for me, but she, she doesn't take any position on that. So that's me, but I think it's crucial for the moment to say that. There is also a derivative level, which is the three-dimensional level. There are many objects, include, including composite ones, beautiful ones like Maria, boring ones like this chair. They're all parts of the wave, okay? Now, consider one such hole, let's say the chair. The state of each of its parts is determined by something about the wave. That's something about the wave, okay? That determines the state of the parts of the chair also determines the state of the whole. That's the picture I think she had, she has in mind. So now the only thing that once again, this I think dovetails nicely to what she says, but for one crucial detail. The fact that she doesn't say anything about whether the wave, the wave or the wave function has parts of the configuration space level. So I'm gonna defend that claim because given that she doesn't endorse that, I just cannot, you know. I cannot just simply take it anymore. And I think she will take issue with that. So here's my argument for why I'm honest, not, not everyone, I'm honest should claim, if you are a monist and you think that the wave is the only fundamental object, then you should think that it has no parts of that. Why? Because if it had proper parts, it would undermine the very rational for being a monist in the first place. Why? Because exactly because wave function uh, uh, wave function realism is a separable metaphysics at the fundamental level. Fixing the state of the parts, if the wave had parts, fixing the state of the parts will fix the state of the whole of, of the whole wave, which in turn will fix everything else. And by transitivity of determination, which I'm going to simply assume, fixing the state of the parts of the wave will fix everything else. So I think there's going to be some pressure on you if you have that view to take the parts of the wave as fundamental. Okay. Because they will fix everything else. Fix the parts of the wave, you will fix the world. That's, that's the claim. That's why I think if you are a monist, I think the better version has it that the wave does not have any parts at the configuration space level. If you are a meteorological priority monist, the parts that it has, they are here. They're in the three-dimensional level. So this is the sketch. And here's my first attempt to make it a little bit more precise. Resorting to fact talks and the primitive relation of determination between facts, which, is, which can be plural in the first argument, namely that uh, a plurality of facts can determine a single fact. And I'm using this because this is just orthodoxy in the metaphysics literature. Uh, facts are arranged into levels, as we said, like of different level, relative fundamentality. We will see how, how, how relative fundamentality comes out of this picture. The configuration space level confi contains configuration space facts. There are a lot of moving parts, unfortunately. I couldn't make it more uh, better than that. So the configuration space level contains configuration space facts, which I'm thinking as the just the following. They are the worldly counterpart of propositions that contains only configuration space language and, and, and perhaps are closed under logical operations. That is, some, so facts are on the form of uh, the way as um, attributes this phase and this amplitude, or this complex number to this point, the configuration space. Same thing for three dimensional levels. Like it contains only facts that, um, uh, that are the worldly counterpart of propositions that contain just three dimensional language. Let's say, for example, this chair is in this partial region here, this partial region of space, like three dimensional space. So here's the construction. First, I'm going to define a notion of relative fundamentality between levels. And I'm going to say the level L, L what did I say? Level LI 
we do, we do here. Level Li is more fundamental than level Lj, if and only if, for every fact in, in the higher level, there is one fact or a collection of facts in the lower level such that this fact determines this, okay? Then I'm gonna define absolute fundamentality just in terms of relative fundamentality, which says, well, something's absolutely fundamental if there is no level, which is more fundamental than that. And of course, level derivativeness is just, level is derivative if it's not fundamental. Okay, good. So now, how do you go to objects here? So there are different, different options. Um, so I tend to think that in the sake of parsimony, I think you should just use meteorology. You should just say that objects constitute facts and constitution can be cashed out in, in meteorological terms. But I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna die on this hill. So, um, uh, so he, he, here's, um, here's another view. Use, use the notion of being about or involving which, so for example, Stephen Yablo has done a lot of work in it. So an object is, is absolutely fundamental. There's a fact in the fundamental level about it and it's derivative if it's not fundamental. Okay. So there's a lot of moving parts here and it can be done, hopefully can be done better, but I think, um, so it's easier in this context because we already know, right? We already know what, what, what's the object in, in, at, at, the, at the fundamental level. It's just the wave. And we know what the objects at the, at the derivative level are. These are three-dimensional objects. So as I was saying, like there's a lot of moving parts here. And I usually like to do things a little bit more precisely than this. But at least I think that this construction earns its keep in the following sense. It captures what wave function really want to say usually, independently of, of their view on monism. They want to say that you know the configuration space level is the fundamental one, and then the you know three dimensional as um, three dimensional level is is the derivative one, and so on and so forth. And most importantly for for the discussion here, it saves uh, the view the view that we are assessing uh, with function monism for from the unfair argument. Why? So here's why this is important, right? So there's going to be three dimensional facts about. So take, take, take any hole, take any three-dimensional hole with parts a PI, okay? So there are facts about the parts. So for example, the fact that part PI is in state phi i. For any such three-dimensional fact, there are configuration space facts such that about the wave, such that those facts determine the fact about, about the parts, let's say, of the chain. And the configuration space part, the facts that determine the individual facts about the parts of the chain also determine collectively facts about the whole. In particular, the collection of configuration space facts determine the fact, which I didn't say, I didn't write, FW, that the, the, state, uh, the state of the whole is phi W, okay? So now this is fixed. Why, why, the, why this saves from this, this picture saves uh, wave function monism from the argument? Because you should note that the state of W that the chair is not really fixed by that of its part, right? It's fixed by the states of the wave that fixes the states of the parts. That's why this is crucially compatible with whole part determination. It's not directly fixed by the state of the part. So here's another way of seeing it. Instead of using separability here, it uses something like, so this is my best shot, but if you have better shots, please. So it uses the following principle, which I will call separability star. A metaphysics is separable star if it admits of composite holes, and for any admissible hole with parts, there are facts, star facts, such that the star facts determine for each part the fact fi that part pi is in state phi i, and the collection of those determines the fact FW that the whole is in state phi W. Now, why separability unstarred, as we saw, is incompatible with the whole uh, part determination. Why this is compatible? Well, this is compatible and, and, and so not inconsistent with all part determination exactly because it does not require the determining facts F star to be facts about the part of the whole you are trying to recover the state of. It doesn't demand that. 
separability demanded that, but separability star doesn't. And that's why it is compatible. In fact, in the case of N, they will crucially not be, right? In the case of N, there will not be things, facts about the parts of the chair. There will be facts about the wave. Okay, so the, the state of the quantum horn we're interested in, say this chair or Oliver, will not be fixed by its parts as separability demands. Rather, but the thing is, look at how distant this is from the original one. It will be fixed by something, the wave of which W itself is part. So in meteorological terms, it's not fixed by its parts. It's actually fixed by proper extensions, which is the confidence of part, as a matter of fact. So separability, why separability in star, again, is not incompatible with whole part determination? It's not only compatible with the whole part determination, right? In the case at hand, for some quantum moves, is an example of top down, right? Because facts that fix the state of the chair are states of, are facts about things of which the chair is part, the way. In this case, and then it's not just compatible. The arrow of determination from star facts to unstar facts goes from whole to parts. It's not just compatible with the whole with top down, it's just a case of top down. Okay, so these I think, so this was my best shot. These I think saves the view. But at what price? Well, the thought is that I think now, okay. Uh, yeah, I still have a little bit of time. Right? We, start, we started about uh, 25 to. Okay, so good. Uh, because I wanted to, to do some speculations. <laughs> because Chris is here. <laughs> so, so now I think you should go back to the argument. And now the other, should, so if, if that's correct, and which is a big if, uh, you should run the argument for wave function monism and wave function realism, sorry, with separability star rather than separability. And now I didn't have the time to actually think about this. So whether now, if you replace separability, separability with separability star, whether, whether the argument goes through. So for example, I don't have now any idea whether 20 is true, for example, um, it is separable. But what I know, what I know, I think is the following, given how Difference, different the, the, the notions are. Separability, it's always bottom up, but a separability star, it's compatible and sometimes top down. I think that it's fair to say that any argument that you had for the, for, for the premise in which you have separability without the star, it's not ipso facto an argument for this. Like if you have an argument, you have to give another one. That's all I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna commit here because I didn't have the time to see whether I'm not even sure the 20 is true, isn't it? Little for 20. So, so you can move to separability star, right? But it's unclear to me that then with function realism will be safe. You, you, you will not lose your master argument, you know, in, 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 in the move. In, 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 how do you say it as local? Anyway, in, in, the, in the move. <laughs> okay. So now, so that actually, but suppose now, so, so I'm going to leave it at that. Right, because I honestly didn't have the, didn't have actually the time to think about 20, as a matter of fact. Um, so I'm gonna leave that there. So I'm gonna say, well, suppose that you, you are okay with the defense I just gave. So here's, so we criticize an argument against, now I'm gonna show you, suppose you think this saves the picture, I'm gonna show you how controversial the consequences of this view are once this is in place for meteorology and location. And this was motivated because I'm trying to draft a book on formal theories on location and one chapter is on applications to philosopher physics and one is this, but let's do meteorology first. Um, so, and the only thing that we need to be reminded is um, that I think that if you're a monist, you should say, that the wave doesn't have any parts at the configuration space level. Here's another way of seeing it. Here's another notion of separability. A metaphysics is configuration space separable. If it admits composite holes at the configuration space level with configuration space parts, and for any admissible such things, the state of the parts determine the state of the hole. Now it just so follows that with functional realism, 
plus the claim that the wave has parts at the configuration space level is configuration space separate, is a configuration space separate from physics. And therefore, the argument is still the same fix the state of the parts, you will fix everything else. So you should be a pluralist and take the parts of the wave to be fundamental rather than the whole wave. So this just tells me that you should say that at, at that level, it doesn't, the wave does not have any parts. Okay. Now, here's the, here's the, 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 um, the thing about meteorology. So the theory on parts and holes, and, and, and Adam has a beautiful paper on meteorology and quantum mechanics. Uh, so consider the sum of all three-dimensional objects. Call it S for sum. S is a derivative three-dimensional object by the, you know, it's the main thesis, and it's a derivative three-dimensional object, which is, according to the view, a part of that, of the wave. Now, the wave is fundamental. This guy is derivative, so they're different, right? They have different properties, therefore they're different. So if it's part of it's different, so straightforward, you know, orthodox definition in meteorology says that it's not just a part, it's a proper part of the wave. Now, once you have that, there are two traditional meteorological principles that will spell trouble for, for the view. Why? We're just gonna look at this. This principle says if X is a proper part of Y, there is a part of Y that doesn't share any part with X. So my hand is a proper part of me, therefore there's a part of me which doesn't share any part with this. Like, so for example, the other hand. Now, why is this problematic? Because sometimes this is, is taken to be a core meteorological principle, and I think this view will violate this. Now, I, I personally cannot make this argument because yesterday, Oliver and I spent the entire afternoon saying that this was, was you know, can be violated. So I, I can't make the argument, but you can. Uh, so why? So take, take X in the antecedent of this uh, to be the sum of three-dimensional things and take Y to be the wave. So now you have, you can see that the antecedent, the antecedent holds. So the consequence says that there is a part of the wave which doesn't share any part with three-dimensional objects. Where does this part come from? We just say that it doesn't have any parts at the configuration space level, so it cannot come from there, but it cannot even come from three-dimensional because the sum of that will overlap everything. So where does it come from? I will call it the hidden part, uh, the hidden part problem for, uh, for the view. Now, as a matter of fact, uh, you can just give up weak supplementation, right? So meteorologies have been developed without, and unfortunately I'm responsible for one of these. So it seems that I'm in no position to make that argument, but Alisa herself actually points out that she would like to retain uh, weak supplementation. And for example, Jonathan Schaffer case for monism, Actually, the, the larger case for monism that she had, that he has, actually depends upon the endorsement of a meteorological theory, which is class in a kind of extension of meteorology, which might be in jeopardy given by the argument that Adam gave in classical in, in, in quantum mechanics. But so Adam gave uh, arguments against composition principles, but these are not composition principles, these are just the composition principles. And the overall case that Schaffer has depends on, on uh, depends on at least this guy here which actually is stronger than this guy here in the logical sense. This guy entails this guy, but the other can't. So it might be that not all, not every monist can, can use the argument that I just gave, just drop the decomposition principles. So I'm just gonna leave it there because once again, I cannot make that. But I think that the most controversial consequences are for location. So here's why I think Alisa sees that. Um, so she says, some may be concerned about viewing the relationship between the wave function and microscopic particles, now it's just particles here, as one of whole parts, due to the fact that parts and holes are located in different space, spatial frameworks. One is located in configuration space, one is located in, in, in um, three-dimensional space. And she replies, it's not a general requirement for meteorological relations to apply to a system of parts and holes. And I think, on the letter of it, I think she's completely right. Meaning like, if you open any text in meteorology, you will not say anything about almost all of them, like, uh, 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 will not say anything about the locations. But, this, but the claim about locations of parts and holes, it's not a claim about meteorology per se. It's a claim about parts, holes, and their locations. The real formal theory of which you should look at it's not meteorology. It uses meteorology, but it's not meteorology. As a matter of fact, the theory of which I'm trying to write a book about, a formal theory of location. 
Okay. So, and as of now, I'm just going to give you a sketch using two notions, exact location and weak location. So I think that you're all familiar with part two, but I'm not sure how familiar you are with exact and weak location. So I'm going to just introduce you the, the, what's called the informal gloss. This should not be taken as definitions. These are implicitly defined by the axiomatic systems you lay down for them. But here, here, here's the informal gloss. Let's say for the exact location. So take me. You can read it while I talk. Take me. My exact location is the cloudy shape, the, the, the cloudy shaped region that I exact that I fit in. So if I do this, right, my exact location should be something like this. If I do this, my exact location is different, and so on and so forth. Oh, good. Weak location, as Josh. Uh, well, Josh Parsons is location in the weakest possible sense. I am weakly located at every, at every region which is not entirely free of me. So this is just to give you an idea. So I'm, I'm weakly located where my heart is, where my hand is, I'm weakly located in this room, I'm weakly located in the UK, so on and so forth. If I actually stick my arm in the corridor, right, I'm, I count as weakly located both in this room and in the corridor. Why? Because you can find bits of me in the corridor. If you go in the corridor, you might bump into a part of me. Okay, so if you have this even uh, informal understanding, I think you should require the following principle to hold. I'm gonna call it, what did I call it? Exact part we call, yeah, my imagination is really amazing. Uh, so, so the claim is, if X is part of Y, and X is exactly located at region R, then Y is weakly located at region R. It just says that, I am weakly located, at least weakly located, where my part are exactly located, right? This seems such a natural principle. I mean, in the end, of course, the regions where my parts are not, not free of me, there's bits of me there, right? So now the dilemma is, of course, either deny the principle 24 or admit that the wave is also located in 3D space. How am I going to argue for this? Well, consider the following case. The wave function has no zero value at just one point in configuration space. Now, this will, will tell you that there are n particles which are exactly located at n points uh, in, in, in spatial, um, in, in just three dimensional space, right? But these are, by definition of the view, right, parts. So, of course, you get the antecedent of that principle. The consequent will tell you that now the wave is located in 3D space. And it's something that Elisa in the book doesn't want to subscribe to. Okay. Now, here's a possible reply. The case you just described is incredibly exceptional. Usually the wave function will not be, uh, will not have value just at one point. It will spread out in, in configuration space. Why this is important? Because if you, if you look at the formalization, which I will have by the course, um, if, if you look at the formalization, it turns out that this now gets vacuously true because the antecedent is false. Why? Because in that case, Alisa would probably simply say, well, the, the point particles do not have any exact location in three-dimensional space. And if they don't, you will see in the formal work that I did uh, later, I, I'll just, I will just rush, uh, that, that the, the, the 24 just gets trivially true. Is, is, is the view saved? Well, I think that there's a weaker principle which will get you the exact same conclusion. So the weaker principle is that if X is part of Y and X is weakly located at region R, then Y is weakly located. So I am weakly located at every region in which my parts are weakly located. So where I just replaced exact location for weak location. And now I don't think you can get out of the problem here even in case in which the wave function is spread out because being weakly located in space, probably so some people like Descartes or, uh, or Marcosi and uh, just stretch 400 years, uh, will take it as definitional of objects to be at least located somewhere in space. And given that the consequence is still the same, you still get the, 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 the same conclusion. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm going to give you a sketch of a theory of location that actually is, is, is powerful enough not to just say that 24 and 25 are plausible principles, they're theorems of my theory. So take weak location as a primitive, which I do it for the technical reason. Uh, we, we can go in the q if you want. So here, here, define my entire location like this. I, I will not go through the definitions, but it, it, it's something like this. So the entire location is, I'm entire, it's, 
where you know where I'm completely where I'm completely located, let's say, right? So I'm entirely located, for example, in this room, but now I'm also entirely located in the in the left half of that room. Like, how do you do it? Well, you know, take take an entire location, right? Well, you try to zoom in, right? At a certain point, you will reach some regions in which I'm not entirely located anymore, right? Pervasive location is the compass. I'm pervasive located at every region which is exactly occupied by one of my parts. So I'm pervasively located where my heart is. Now, how do you get my exact location? Well, you start from my heart and then, th th then you zoom out, right? So now this thing says exact location is just when you're both pervasively and entirely, which means like you zoom in from, you know, from this room, you zoom out from my heart. And when you, when, when you, when you touch, when you both, when you agree, it's like, you know, taking the outer measure and the uh, and interior measure, measure theory. When they agree, that's my exact location. So now, if you just give me the following principle, that the exact location of a whole is the sum of the exact location of its proper parts, then this guy is going to be a theorem. If X is pervasively located um, at R, then X um, is weakly located at R. So you're weakly located where you're pervasively located. It seems like even intuitively, right? If I'm weakly located where my heart is, clearly the region of my heart is not completely free of me, right? And now 24 and 25 come out as theorems. They're not just plausible principles you can deny. These are just theorems of your theory of location. And technically, I use this theory of location rather than something else because I want a theory of location that doesn't have the following as a theorem. It doesn't, it shouldn't entail that if you are weakly located somewhere in space, then you have a precise location. So I choose this formal theory rather than something else, exactly because it doesn't have that as a concept. Why? Because the case at hand, right? So re remember the move, the move that the move that the guy made is exactly, oh, in the case in which wave function, the wave function is spread in configuration space is a case in which the three particles don't have exact location. So I I'd better actually have a theory of location that doesn't entail this as a theorem. That's why I chose this. Okay, good. So here's a reply. And then I'm just gonna do something about uh, the, the one speculation. And that's it. So here's a reply that Alisa made, which I think is a good point. And it's a good point. Lewis. Actually, we were thinking about the, 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 the paper that Adam wrote about meteorology. Say, well, it's like, so if you read the, 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 the paper by Adam and meteorology in quantum mechanics, it says, um, look, quantum mechanics forces us to rethink principles of classical meteorology, like summation principles, for example. Why cannot be the, the case here? Right? Why? Why? The gist of the argument is the following thing. Well, you know, we thought that 24 and 25 were, you know, natural principles, but this is just because we were thinking in classical terms about chairs and people and so on and so forth. Maybe the lesson to, to, to get from your argument is just that quantum mechanics forces us to revisit those principles, like as uh, in Adam's paper, right? quantum mechanics might force us to rethink classical fusion principles for meteorology. But I want to say this, um, well, it's not just quantum mechanics per se, right? It's quantum mechanics plus the claim that the particles are parts of the wave function. And the last claim is, it's not a claim about quantum mechanics per se, it's just a metaphysical claim. And all I'm saying is that faced with the argument above, you might reject that claim rather than the principle. But it's not just a quantum mechanics per se. So, I mean, I mean this, you know, this classical guy that wants just to retain my, my, my principle of location, just because I, you know, I happen to write a book about them and I have it in chapter seven, so I cannot give them up. I mean, that too, but <laughs> just, just leave it aside. Uh, you know, the appearance that I don't want to redo the thing. No, but, but really it comes, so you need the, the farther claim. And you might want to say, well, faced with the arguments, I just want to get. So, um, so now, so where were we at? So I don't think that any of this is the size of it. Yes, I'm gonna I'm just gonna decisive. This is, how, how do you say that in English? Decisive against size against that. But faced with this, you might want to think about different combinations. And suppose you want to be a priority metalog. So, so these are possible combinations. I'm gonna focus on this because I think I think I can make it into Chris space-time state space realism picture. So say, suppose you want to be a metallurgical priority mechanism. Okay. In, in, instead of saying that the wave is the fundamental object, say that space-time, the entire space-time is the fundamental object. 
say that um, the, the universal wave function or the, or, or the universal density matrix is a property like it's a property like entity of the entire space time. Okay, then say that space time has a meteorological structure. That, that's the key claim, right? So subregions are really proper parts. Okay, and now the monistic claim is that you can. So if you give me the, the, the wave function of the entire space time, I can determine like the density matrix associated with different regions of space time. Okay, but but I cannot do the other. Like I cannot recover from from the density matrix of, 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 of space time subregions one about about the whole. So you're going to get close to this, okay? So I think that state space, space time, state space realism might be actually mass. I mean, might be might fit into this picture. On one condition, though, right? If you think about it, these are very organic pictures in which there's only one relation that relates the fundamental thing in this case, space time, and the derivative ones, proper part. Now all you get here is that proper parts of space time are derivative. The good thing is that they exist, right? So you use determination exactly because that doesn't tell, you don't get the eliminativism. So you, and you don't get, therefore, in, in, in the language of the first, you don't get existence, existence monism. You still get that there are. Now, the issue is whether you think that on top of space time subregions, also I exist and I'm not identical to one of those. Because if you think that I exist and I'm not identical to one of those, then it, it, it might not even this one be a version of, of that. But you can, if you identify Oliver with, with, with the space-time region, then I think it's a straightforward case of that. Now, I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna. So th this, this is, this is if, if you do it, things a little bit more precisely. And just, just to go back to the magic mountain to which, you know, so at the end of the, so you can take a walk from the sanatorium, right? To the, so at a certain point in the book, spoiler, uh, they move out of the sanatorium and they go uh, live together, these two philosophers, um, in, in an apartment in, 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 the, in the new part of town. And they talk and they talk. And, and NAFTA, this, this character, has this beautiful argument against monism, which is it's just boring, right? It's just boring. Um, so I thought, so that, and he just says, doesn't monism bore you? All monism is boring. And at least I think the one thing that we should take out, monism might be false, but it's not boring. At least that, right? Um, but, but another lesson I think it's more important that I think us metaphysicians did this our fault. I think I've, I've put this discussion of fundamentality in such tight constraint that now, for example, pluralism and monism comes out of uh, exclusive and, but I think it's better if I would be, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just leave you with a plea for pluralism which I think is encompassed in this beautiful, beautiful, one of the, one of the greatest writers, Italian writers of the last century, Italo Calvino. This is an incredible novel. It's called Invisible Cities. I'll just leave it there so you can read it, in which I think uh, is advocating for uh, pluralities about the notion of fundamentality. And I cannot clearly do better than Calvino. So I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you.